Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. Uh, to my right is uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 uh, briefing for British Columbia for Thursday, June the 10th. We're honored to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Tomorrow, Friday, we'll be providing an update, a written update around 3 o'clock uh, of relevant information about the COVID-19 pandemic in British Columbia. On Monday, um, we'll be providing a further update on COVID-19 and we'll be addressing issues on Monday uh, around Step 1 and Step 2. And the Premier will be joining us at that time. Um, uh, with that, uh, having, uh, we're of course uh, honored to be here, especially at, uh, at these times on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. And it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, so today we'll start off with an update on our immunization and uh, numbers of cases and then we'll talk uh, an update on uh, the data that it we're using and following on a regular basis. So as of today, 74.9, not quite 75 percent of all adults 18 and older in British Columbia have been immunized against COVID-19. 72.8% uh, of everyone 12 and older have now received their first dose. So that is uh, 3,823,103 doses of all three of our COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in British Columbia. And of those, 443,562 uh, people have received second doses. This equates to about 325,000 immunizations every week in the last few weeks. It is important to note that invitations to book your second dose will be sent after eight weeks for all of the vaccines that we have. And I know that uh, we've, there's been a lot of concern and discussion about uh, when we're starting to, to uh, book second doses. And at this point, given the strong demand, appointments may take one to two to three weeks later as we get through the, the large group of people in this first cohort who are, are coming up on 16 weeks. Every appointment that we have in our clinics here in BC is connected to a single dose of vaccine and we're using every last dose to get people fully immunized as soon as we can. That means that it is important um, to book your appointment so that we know how many people are showing up and can have those doses there. As we've said many times, uh, by the time we get to the end of Sunday and early into Monday, uh, our supply of vaccines that we've received every week is mostly used up. So we are dependent on the new supply coming in, usually for Pfizer. That happens on Mondays, Monday afternoons and Tuesday mornings. So we can continue for those appointments for the week. Right now, uh, we're limited still by the supply that's coming in. Thankfully, it's much more than it was in the uh, early months of this year. And we're moving through these as as quickly as we possibly can and we've heard some good news about additional doses of Moderna coming in the coming weeks and that will allow us to expand our immunization program even more. I would like to assure people though that this dose interval is well within the safe range for everyone and we know now um, that uh, people who the, there's evidence emerging that you get a stronger and longer lasting um, protection if the interval is greater than eight weeks. And uh, as a matter of fact, for older people, it's three and a half times higher in one study when the interval was 11 to 12 weeks. So those are the things that we're watching carefully. And we know that people are very concerned about getting that second dose in, and it is important to boost that personal protection that we have. But we all need to recognize that our strategy of getting as many people with their first dose as possible is working and our risk for all of us is going down. And we'll talk more about that in the modeling as well. In terms of cases, we have 153 new people diagnosed with COVID-19 in BC today, bringing the total number of people uh, with COVID-19 to 145,996. Of the new cases, 21 are people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 73 people live in the Fraser Health Region, 11 people are in uh, the Vancouver Island Health Region, 
39 in are people who live in the interior health region and 9 in the northern health region. Currently, we have 1,910 active cases around the province. 176 people are in hospital, 49 of whom are in critical care or ICU. And 142,314 people have recovered from their acute infection. Sadly, today we have an additional four people who have died from COVID-19. One of those people were in their 50s, one in their 60s, and two were people who were over 80 years of age. Bringing the total number of people we've lost to COVID-19 to 1,729. And our condolences go out to all of those who have lost loved ones, to their families and communities. Our thoughts are with you in this difficult time. We do have five active outbreaks in long-term care and assisted living, and two in acute care. So turning now to our our June update of the model of the modeling and data that we've been using to, to manage our COVID response. Uh, the first uh, slide we'll present is the geographic distribution. This is by local health area to be consistent with the uh, presentations that we've been giving monthly uh, since March of last year. Um, and it really does show, this is cumulative, so it shows that there have been no areas of the province that have not been affected by COVID-19, but some areas certainly have been affected more than others, and particularly in the lower mainland. But we also see that in some of our more rural areas in the north, particularly the northeast, have been highly impacted. The good news is this is the information about cases and case rates in the last week. And happily, we see that in most areas of the province, there have been little to no cases in many, many communities. There continues to be transmission in the lower mainland and a few hotspots, including in the, the Peace region in the north and also in the uh, Grand Forks area in the south. And in, in some of those smaller communities, the case rates can be quite high, even though the numbers are small. But this reminds us that there still can be transmission if we're not careful. But it does also reflect the fact that as many more people are protected through immunization, our risk of transmission and the risk of the virus in our communities is going down dramatically. These are the um, dot plots that we've been using to help identify hot spots in, in communities around the province. And we can see that there are still uh, high areas in, in high case counts in some areas, including Surrey being uh, at the top in the province. However, the good news is that this has dramatically, dramatically decreased by over 50% in the last two weeks. So that is a testament to people doing what they need to do and the immunization that we're uh, that is happening in those communities across the province. When we look at case rates, we see that uh, areas like Grand Forks, where it is a very small population, um, have a higher rate of transmission. But again, the, the, the positive that we see in this is that most of the rates have dropped quite dramatically in the last few weeks. This is our overall epidemiologic curve that has our cases at the top and uh, the middle line is hospitalizations and along the bottom the number of people who have died from COVID-19 over time. And what we can see quite happily is uh, starting in the, the middle of April we have a dramatic drop in cases overall and sh shortly thereafter we started to see a decrease in hospitalizations that continues. One of the things that we note on this and it reflects again the, the power of the immunization programs that we have, is that deaths have remained low throughout the third wave, despite having the highest number of people if infected in the whole of our pandemic here in BC. And that reflects our program, our immunization program that was targeted at protecting those most at risk, particularly our seniors and elders in the community and in long-term care. And it really reflects how um, immunization has changed the landscape of this pandemic. And we can see that this is reflected across the province. Although um, the pandemic has been experienced slightly differently in different health areas of our province. We know that Vancouver Coastal and Fraser, where the majority of the cases and the highest case rates have been, have uh, had a similar bimodal um, 
uh, pandemic, but in the interior and particularly in the north, there has been consistently mm. higher rates over an extended period of time, even though the numbers are smaller. But thankfully, we've seen a dramatic decrease in both areas in the last few weeks. And again, reflecting the, the power of the vaccines that we have right now and the measures that we're taking to reduce transmission in our own communities, in our own social networks. We also see the, the uh, change over time um, by age. And we've seen in all age groups in the last few weeks, we've had dramatic decreases. And it's gone sequentially as different age groups have been eligible for immunization. Um, one of the things that uh, we can note here is the purple line, which is people 80 and above. And again, it stayed low and steady uh, during the, the third wave, reflecting the power of the vaccines that we have to protect people individually after even a single dose. Finally, we're looking around the province. This is uh, the, our daily case rates and the percent positive of cases that we've had up until uh, the end of last week. And in all cases, we're seeing, again, a decrease not only in numbers of people uh, testing positive, um, but across the board um, decreases in uh, percent positivity, despite having high testing rates. This is a reflection uh, of the more serious illness that we're seeing, and it's still uh, hospitalizations on the left and the number of people who have died on the right. And it does show the picture that this virus um, does have most serious effects in people who are older, particularly um, people who are in their 60 to 79 or over 80 age group. Here's an updated uh, a review of the data uh, looking at the distribution of cases, hospitalizations, ICU admissions and deaths by age compared to the percent of that age group in our population. And uh, we still have very few cases and uh, very few serious cases in young people, particularly uh, people under the age of 10. We have sadly had two people who have died, uh, one a toddler and the other an infant under the age of 10. We've had no deaths and very few hospitalizations in, in school-aged children from 10 to 19. And uh, we know that the risk goes up of having severe illness, having hospitalization, and sadly death as age increases. We have been paying particular attention to school-aged uh, children so 5 to 18 years in BC. And overall, the numbers of cases remain low in the, this age group. Hospitalization is 10 times lower in school-aged children compared to adults. And for the most part, it is less than the percent of the population. So um, thankfully, young children in particular are underrepresented in illness with COVID. Some of the things that are important for us to watch over time is what strains of the virus are circulating in our community and how many of them are what we're terminated, what has been called uh, variants of concern because they may increase uh, transmissibility in uh, most of them at this point are, have increased ability to transmit between people, making it that much more challenging uh, to, to stop transmission and stop outbreaks. So this is a reflection uh, of the, uh, the epidemic in the different parts of the province and in British Columbia overall. And what we can see is that the variants of concern that have been identified um, are now the, the predominant strains that are circulating in people and being transmitted across the province. Um, even though the numbers are very small in some places, even in Vancouver Coastal where it's as high as 100% of them are variants of concern, the same measures that we are taking to prevent transmission of any of the strains of the virus are working to prevent transmission and to reduce the numbers of people with this infection in communities across the province. I will say that we have um, adapted our testing strategy as we've talked about a number of times. We were using a screening test, but that has limitations and it can't detect every single uh, variant or every different strain of the virus that is circulating in the province. And as we get smaller and smaller case numbers and as we start to open up more and people are traveling more, it is more and more important that we know exactly which 
strains of which virus are circulating where. And to that end, we've now moved, as of a couple of weeks ago, to doing a whole genome sequencing on 100% of our cases in British Columbia. So what we know exactly which strains are infecting people across the province, and we have the capacity in our lab to do that. We've done uh, close to 33,000 uh, whole genome sequences since the pandemic began, and it has helped us in understanding how outbreaks have been transmitted, um, whether there's uh, variants that are causing clusters or outbreaks in workplaces, in long-term care. And now every single case, we are able to determine exactly what strain is circulating. And this is a, a summary of the relative proportion of just the variants of concern that have been identified by the WHO that are in our province over time, with the, the, the bar on the far right being uh, the week of uh, May 3rd to June 5th. And we can see that uh, the, the predominant strains that we're seeing circulating are the what's now called alpha and uh, beta strains, uh, sorry, the uh, delta. <laughs> <laughs> the WHO is supposed to make this easier by switching to uh, Greek uh, names, but um, it's the alpha and gamma that we have most commonly here in, in British Columbia, so the P1 and the B1.17. And we have seen some geographic variation with uh, the B1.17 seen more, more commonly in Fraser Health and uh, P1 in Vancouver Coastal. But all of those are coming down. This is the proportion of the strains that we're seeing. The, the beta, the one that uh, was originated in South Africa, we did see some of that circulating in BC, but that has mostly been, uh, been contained and controlled by the measures that we took to prevent transmission and, of course, by protection from immunization. Right now, we are seeing uh, some transmission um, with people infected with the Delta strain, but it is a small number and a small proportion of the, of the cases that we're seeing on a daily basis. And on the BCCDC website, you can look in detail at all of the different strains that we're seeing circulating in BC. There's about 14 other additional strains um, that we're watching and monitoring with whole genome sequencing, ones that have mutations that we want to be able to um, understand if they're being transmitted in the province, and it includes strains that were identified in New York, California, in Brazil, um, et cetera. So those, this, is, this is going to be more and more important for us as our case numbers decrease and as we have more people moving around the, the country, the province, and eventually internationally to understand exactly which viruses are being transmitted between people is how we um, detect whether a new strain that might have um, some other advantage, whether that means vaccine doesn't work as well or if it transmits more easily or causes some more, more severe illness. So this is a, an important role that the BCCDC will be doing and has been doing in BC and will be linking with whole genome sequencing from across the country. I know there has been some concerns that uh, that we are not detecting all of the strains that are circulating and that things like the Delta uh, strain could be um, accelerating and, and we're not able to detect it here in BC with the strategy that we have for testing and with our lab being able to do, have the capacity to do whole genome sequencing rapidly on all cases means that we are in a good place to monitor this carefully over time. So finally, to go on to the other important part of our program, our vaccination progress, and this is the dashboard summary in one slide. Up on the on the right, uh, the dial indicates the proportion of people with first doses, which uh, as of yesterday was only 72 percent. As I mentioned, it's up to 74.9 today, and our second doses uh, uh, has is up a, a little bit above 8 percent now. Um, the what we call a population pyramid on the left-hand side gives you an idea of the size of each age cohort and the number of people who've been, or the proportion of people who've been immunized with the blue uh, being first dose and the green being second dose. As we can see, that that is increasing, uh, starting with our older age groups and moving down through to 12 to 17-year-olds, um, now having a, a good start on uh, getting up with uh, first doses. Uh, we also see that it's not equal across 
the province. And certainly in some areas, in northern health and in interior health, we're having more challenges in reaching people, and we're taking different strategies to make sure that people have access to vaccine across the province. This is a, another summary which shows the trajectory of how, uh, how, how people uh, the progress in immunization uh, percentage by age um, across the province. And what we can see is, is as people became eligible in that age group, we had increased rates of, of, uh, of immunization, and then it leveled off somewhere around 80 percent. One of the things that we are seeing is in the younger cohorts, that leveling off is happening a little bit earlier. So we're doing more uh, targeting towards younger people to make sure that they are um, getting immunized, especially with first doses in the younger cohort. And then at the very end, uh, the 12 plus is uh, the summary of how we're doing uh, with immunization across the board um, in the province. And to put that into a context geographically, this gives a sense of the vaccine coverage by local health area for people 12 and above. And I will note the lightest color green is uh, above 50 percent. So everywhere in the province we've reached 50 percent coverage for people 12 and above. But in some areas that is much higher. And the highest, the darkest green is 80 percent. And it's uh, really great to see that in many areas of the province we've reached 70 to 80 percent in uh, coverage in people 12 and above. And if we look at this same information for people age 50 and above, even more areas of the province are covered. But this does tell us there are some pockets where there's still more work to be done, both to encourage people to be immunized and to make sure they have access to vaccines, particularly in the Northeast, in some parts of the Central Okanagan and uh, the Grand Forks, Kettle Valley area, and of course in uh, some parts of the Lower Mainland, particularly in Richmond area. So given where we are with our case rates, uh, where we're seeing uh, by age and by geography and where our immunization program is going, we now are able to look at our modeling and to understand the trajectory of where we're going right now. So this is our reproductive rate over time and it really shows that for the first time in many, many months we are trending downwards, we're below one, which means that uh, the, on average people are, are transmitting the virus to less than one people every time somebody is infected. And this is across the board for the first time in many, many weeks. If you remember the last time we presented in uh, end of April, early May, we were, we were actually on a trajectory above one and heading up. And this is really great news and it means that people uh, have been paying attention. It means the immunization is making a difference and the measures that we've been taking together have meant that transmission has gone down. We've been protecting our family, our communities across the board. And we use that information to help us understand what could happen next. And so this is the, the dynamic compartmental modeling with some uh, trajections of what can happen, what could be ahead for, for us given what we're seeing in terms of transmission in our communities and immunization rates. And this also is a good news story. With the measures that we've been taking and slowly um, getting through this last step one of our restart, what we are seeing is that yes, even with um, increase contact, so increase contact rate as much as 80 percent over the next few weeks, we are likely to see more cases arise. But they're not going to be uh, widely transmitted in our communities the way that we have seen before. Um, like we saw in March where we started to see rapid exponential growth because we still didn't have enough people protected to prevent those transmissions from happening and we were having contacts with larger numbers of people. So we are confident now that with what we're seeing, with the immunization and the protection that we have in our communities across the board and with the public health measures that we know work, that we can manage a slight increase in cases as we move forward over the next few weeks. But it also depends on us. It depends on us taking our time, doing things slowly and surely, and making sure that we are testing, 
tracing and tracking those basic public health functions that we know work to stop transmission and to, to stop clusters when they occur. As, as this presentation shows us, we will be in a good position to continue safely moving forward with our restart plan. And we'll be talking more about that next week as we move into um, the, the next phase of our plan. For the first time in many months, our R0, our reproductive rate, which tells us how many people each new case is spreading to, is well below one in all health regions. As well, community transmission, hospitalizations and deaths are all declining as immunizations go up. The key to our success is everybody. It's all of you. First to lessen the spread and then to get immunized. I want you to know how grateful and thankful we all are that you have and continue to do your part across BC. And we see that reflected in the numbers of people who are being immunized and everybody doing their bit. For 16 months, it has been our individual and collective efforts to use our layers of protection, to follow all of our public health orders. And now it's also to get fully immunized with your first and second dose of COVID-19 vaccine that is making all the difference. We've, want, we've done the right things and we want and need to keep going. We're bridging still from a time of orders and restrictions to a time when we can safely spend time with others once again. As we look to next week and next month, we will keep progressing through this phase. Step two is coming up and so far the data that we have is supporting that we can go there. I'm confident that we can take this step as long as we increase our contacts in a slow and measured way. We register and get fully vaccinated. We use our layers of protection and continue to support one another with kindness and compassion. We need to recognize that this transition will be gradual and we all have our own reasons to go slower in some places. We need to respect both communities and individuals and workplaces, risks and need and desire to progress at a slower level given their own risk tolerance and what's happening to them personally or in their community. So let's continue to push our immunizations as high as they can go and that will help us put the pandemic behind us. The vaccines that we have in here in Canada are safe and effective. One of the major side effects that they have is hope, optimism and a brighter future ahead. And let's also remember that we can get there by doing what we have been doing all along, by being kind, being calm and staying safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And I want to start by uh, uh, passing on my condolences to the families, the friends, the caregivers of the four people who passed away linked to COVID-19 in British Columbia in the last 24 hours, two in Fraser Health, two in Vancouver Coastal Health. And uh, to, to know that all of us, I think, in the province, especially at this time in the pandemic, and Dr. Henry just spoke about the hope we see ahead of us, how difficult it is at this time in the pandemic to lose someone linked to COVID-19 and how those families and those friends and those caregivers are grieving and we grieve with them today. Uh, I note that um, we've seen a, a, another significant decline in the number of people in acute care hospitals from a high of 511 at the beginning of the, of the, or at the middle of the third wave to 176 today, that from 183 in critical care at the beginning of the third wave to 49 today. I do want to note that uh, our hospitals are extraordinarily busy that the reduction in COVID-19 related uh, patients has been met with an increase in other patients as happens in hospitals and as we might expect. Uh, for example, in emergency rooms yesterday, there were 6,394 emergency room visits, which is only slightly below 
uh, the level, the average level of ER visits before the pandemic. And one area in the four of the health authorities plus the Provincial Health Services Authority, it's still significantly below, below, or significantly below. And Vancouver Island, where the pandemic has taken a different course, the emergency room visits yesterday were 24.3% higher than they were in on March 9th. Uh, 2020, which was um, at uh, at uh, before the declaration of the pandemic, so uh, I want to give a special world word of thanks to uh, our hospital workers, members of the hospital employees union, our nurses, our doctors, our health sciences professionals, those who keep our hospitals safe and clean, and our as well the people who prepare the food. Everyone in our hospital system to know that we understand what a challenging time this is, and we so admire and appreciate and support the work that they do. I wanted to just um, note as well that yesterday 73,345 uh, more people were vaccinated. And just to give a sense of that, uh, 54,608 of those doses were the Pfizer vaccine, 10,735, the Moderna vaccine, and 8,002 in our pharmacy system were second dose of AstraZeneca. In addition to that, if you look by age group, and we saw some of this data in Dr. Henry's uh, presentation, that uh, we're also seeing some significant progress in second dose immunization, which is actually, um, and if you look at by age group, 88% of those 70 and above have received their first dose, 24% their second dose. 60 and above is 85% their first dose, 17% their second dose and 15 above 82 percent first dose and 14 percent second dose and uh, 40 and above 80 percent first dose and 13 percent second dose across the province 12 and up it's 73 percent rounding up just below 73 percent first dose and 10 percent second dose and 18 and above at 75 percent first dose and 10 percent second dose so um, in short uh, we're uh, making progress in both uh, in all of those areas and we're focusing in on what's sometimes called the ground game uh, of uh, communities which are somewhat lower for first doses. As you'll note in the north, the, in the Northern Health Authority, because we distributed vaccines um, fairly uh, equally across the province, uh, second dose vaccinations are higher in the Northern Health Authority, but we're very focused on ensuring an increasing number of first dose vaccinations everywhere. Everyone, you will know as well, and you've heard from the federal government that we're expecting, although this hasn't been guaranteed, we haven't received shipping dates, so they're not integrated into our system yet. We're expecting more uh, doses of Moderna, and that is good news, and we'll have more to say about that next week. Um, uh, on Thursday, typically um, report on surgical renewal. Uh, and I want to say uh, there's good news that all nine Metro Vancouver hospitals are now back to full operations all nine in our surgical renewal update this week. You might recall that last week we reported that due to an outbreak at Richmond Hospital, we had to delay the resumption of non-urgent scheduled surgeries until June the 14th through a, uh, through a remarkable demonstration of care and of effort of all involved and by carefully balancing inpatient and day surgery. Richmond Hospital opened all its operating rooms on June the 7th, all of them. I also want to update on the situation at Kelowna General Hospital. On June the 3rd, we announced the outbreak there, and through a similarly inspiring effort by everyone, there have to date been no impacts on surgeries. The surgical teams who have managed through this pandemic across all our health authorities have never wavered from their commitments to patients or their dedication to getting patients the care that they need. And with that, here's this week's report. From May 31st to June 6th, no surgeries were postponed in the Fraser, Vancouver Island, Interior, Northern, and Provincial Health Services Authority. Due to COVID-19, 93 surgeries were postponed in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. This is the week from May 31st to June 6th. That said, well, we expect that we will report a small number of further postponements next week because some surgeries were shifted to balance the surgery types. We expect no further postponements due to the third wave. and that is a welcome result, a result and a relief for so many. And uh, therefore, fortunately, this will be the last time I'll be reporting on them. Still, this means that 2,399 surgeries were postponed from April 19th to June 6th. From uh, May 24th to May 30th, health authorities completed 6,048 surgeries, of which 4,618 were scheduled surgeries and 1,430 were unscheduled surgeries. 
you recall that that was the uh, day of the Meilan weekend. And so uh, typically in those weeks, which are four-day full weeks, there are fewer surgeries postponed. It was a similar number to last year. Uh, the th the by health authority, that's 1,610 in Fraser, 1,158 in the Interior Health Authority, 333 in Northern Health, 1,382 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 1,313 in Vancouver Island Health, and 252 in the Provincial Health Services Authority. Uh, the third wave brought new challenges to our delivery of non-urgent scheduled surgeries, but our effort to learn throughout the, our pandemic and our strength at adaptation every step of the way played a critical role in getting our operating rooms back to full steam safely and rapidly. Patients who had their surgeries postponed in the past few weeks are, I think, in the very best hands, and we are moving just as fast to get you the surgeries you need. The achievements in surgery reported today, I think, should inspire all of us for those in need of surgery and those whose surgery was postponed. I hope the feeling is one of relief, of renewed confidence, of certainty that soon things will be better. And for the rest of us, I hope the inspiration is just as personal to keep going, to keep playing our role in limiting further outbreaks that impact surgeries and cause heartache to those in need of them, to keep registering, booking our appointments, and getting our first and second doses, to keep using our COVID skills uh, every day to keep following the guidance that keeps people healthy and to keep adhering to the public health orders that stop the spread, to keep doing our essential work to ensure that those in need of surgery get the surgery they're counting on so that they are part of our growing achievement in giving COVID a smaller, less intrusive role in our lives, in all of our lives. Uh, thank you very much and we're happy to take your questions. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. First question, Richard Zussman, Global News. Dr. Henry, you're making it pretty clear here, especially with Premier Horgan joining you, that we can expect to move to step 2 on Monday. Can you tell British Columbians more specifically what you are looking at between step two and step three. The plan is, is vague in some regards. What are we looking at in terms of where we're going to get with hospitalizations, ICU cases, and are you worried at that point moving to step three around uh, different communities and outbreaks and low levels of vaccination in those communities? Yeah, so what we're looking at in terms of the data, and it is a little bit vague, we say cases are low. And, and that recognizes that as we get down um, to low numbers of cases, um, that even a small increase, uh, a small cluster of cases will mean the numbers go up a little bit. But that's okay. What we need to, to focus on is are there small enough numbers of cases that we can manage from a public health perspective the same way we would any other reportable communicable disease. So making sure that public health can, uh, that we we can get access to testing rapidly, that we follow up with cases, that we manage to stop transmission to contacts, and that we can manage those over time. So even a, a rather large cluster, as long as we can um, manage it through public health activities, we are um, keeping people safe in communities. And so that's why it is intentionally a little bit vague. So there's no specific number that we are looking at, but it is around uh, finding that, that balance of reducing transmission as much as we possibly can and getting people protected as much as we possibly can. And we still are in a bridging uh, place. I've been using that term bridging, I guess, from uh, as we started in the restart. We're not in a place where we can fully take away all of the things that we've been doing to prevent transmission. But we're getting towards that. And part of it is because we have safe and effective vaccines. And part of it is because we are reducing the numbers of risky contacts we have and getting tested and making sure that if we're sick or around somebody who's sick, we stay away from others. So all of those things will become and will continue to be important in the next few weeks as we move into July. And then we need to start gradually moving from having orders to having that guidance that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to keep ourselves, uh, to, to stay away from others if we're feeling well, unwell ourselves, to get back to this being living, learning to live with COVID and recognizing that it's not going to spread widely in the community the way it did um, even a few weeks ago. 
Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. This is for uh, both Minister Dix and Dr. Henry. Uh, there's been uh, some criticism that BC doesn't have any new safety measures in place for long-term care when it comes to the reopening. In Ontario and Quebec, they've made full vaccination mandatory for long-term care staff. If they refuse, there are steps they have to go through. Why won't BC make staff vaccination mandatory in long-term care? And uh, is there consideration being given to making vaccination uh, mandatory uh, for visitors, uh, unbidden visitors into long-term care? Yeah, so we have, as you know, uh, revised our visitation policy and put that in place using the data that we had um, around how well the vaccination was working, both to protect residents individually and as a community in those in those settings. And we revised that at the same time in March um, to allow those so important visits, especially family visits and longer visits with residents, um, at the same time that we were putting in restrictions in the community. And that that's really adjusting the response based on what we saw um, in the real world from the data that we were seeing. And yes, we have a number of things in place. Uh, as we have learned how effective the vaccine is, um, both on an individual level, but also um, how uh, it affects facilities and the rates of transmission in facilities. As you know, we have had a few outbreaks in, in long-term care homes. And there's been a couple that where it spread quite uh, rapidly, despite most residents being immunized and most staff. So yes, we are revising that. We're looking at the policy. Um, we have still in place a single site order. And as part of moving forward into the next phase of this, we will be looking at um, how do we ensure that everybody in these most highly vulnerable settings are immunized uh, with two doses as much as possible. So those are things that we're working on currently. And uh, yes, it's incredibly important and it, re it continues to be incredibly important that we do that immunization in long-term care for everybody who's going into a long-term care home um, is critical. Yes, Richard, and I think that uh, what you'll expect is uh, uh, we'll be, as we have, adapting and revising issues of visitation and other issues in long-term care. You'll recall that um, at the time we brought in the, uh, the circuit breaker on March 29th, four days earlier, we actually um, r relaxed very significantly visitation in long-term care. And so we are continuing to look at those issues. They weren't part of the announcement, the, the four-step announcement on uh, uh, a number of weeks ago in, in late May. But what uh, we're significantly looking at, at all of the issues you discuss, issues around vaccination. And I would say that 33,219 residents have received their first dose in long-term care and 28,703 residents their second dose, 41,000. 486 long-term care staff, their first dose, 27,755, their second dose. So we're looking at all of those questions, including further uh, revisions to visitation. The long-term care issue, we, we were at a different place, and I think the changes that were made in visitation on March 25th were the right time to make those changes, the safe time to make those changes, and the impact of those on the quality of life of, in long-term care have been profound. And we're going to continue to revise and adapt to ensure uh, to increase, we hope, access and the openness of long-term care so that people uh, can engage in the social activity that's particularly important in long-term care and at the same time continue to revise measures to keep everybody safe. So you'll be seeing um, action on that soon. It's not, as it wasn't in March, it's not directly related to uh, the phased um, easing of restrictions that we saw uh, starting at the end of May and which we're considering in terms of a new step now. Final thing I'd say is this, that the measures that are in place are the measures that are in place. And I think the, that British Columbians support a step-by-step -step approach. We said that there would be no changes before June 15th. There won't be changes before June 15th, which means that we need people to follow that uh, this weekend. And similarly, with respect to the third step, said there won't be changes before July 1st. 
and there won't be changes before July 1st. It's that step-by-step -step approach that I think builds confidence. I think British Columbians have, are supportive of that, are responding well to that, and are themselves and their communities leading on that. And so the people will know what to expect and uh, will move forward over the next few weeks. Next question, Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify, just following up on Richard's question, uh, is there a chance that you will look at mandatory vaccination uh, for care home workers uh, or some kind of power for employees to at least find out who is vaccinated and, and have the authority to reassign people if necessary? Uh, absolutely. We're looking at all of the options around how do we ensure that uh, residents and uh, excuse me, residents in long-term care are protected to the, the fullest extent possible. And that is part of that. It will be ensuring that um, people who work in long-term care are immunized. But there are a number of different factors to consider around that. So it is access to vaccine, uh, first and second doses, and what other measures need to be in place for people who, um, for whatever reason, are unable to be immunized. So yes, we are actively working on all of those um, in terms of uh, uh, the progression of the policy for uh, workers in long-term care. Justine, do you have a follow-up? I do, thanks. Um, as in a similar vein, so we're talking about these restart phases uh, next week and through the summer. I'm just looking ahead to the fall and wondering what needs to be done in terms of preparing for that and the potential for uh, resurgence of COVID cases. Is there any kind of plan underway for, for example, ventilation improvements in schools or in care homes to prepare for that next respiratory season? Yeah, so we are looking at this and uh, how we've been looking at it with our, our tables uh, around restart is um, how do we get to these next phases and uh, dependent on the data that we're seeing on immunization and how do we move out of the pandemic mode that we're in and into living with COVID and that does mean that we will need to monitor and understand the transmission of this virus as we go into our normal respiratory season next fall. So what does that mean in terms of surveillance and testing? What does that mean in terms of being able to detect and manage outbreaks in schools, in uh, long-term care homes, as we do for influenza and RSV and other things? So yes, we are uh, planning for that as well. And what will it mean to uh, healthcare facilities? What will it mean to schools? What will it mean to businesses if we start to see increasing rates in a community or across the board? Or how do we respond to individual outbreaks like we do every year for other respiratory viruses? It's going to be some time before we, uh, some time in terms of years, before we understand exactly how COVID is going to evolve. But we can expect there will be transmission next fall, um, and it, it's yet to be seen um, whether that transmission is going to be more like a bad influenza season or whether it will be uh, milder. So we need to be prepared for all eventualities, and that is the work that we're doing now, and it will be built in to um, the next phases of our restart program. But we don't believe, given the, that what we have seen about long-lasting protection from immunization, that we will have to take those across the board, um, very severe measures that we've had to take to get us through this last few, um, these last 16 months. But it'll be more focal, more uh, working with public health in a local area to manage clusters and outbreaks as they arise. And we will need to think about what are the things that we need to do personally and individually, things like staying home if we're sick, getting tested, um, wearing masks in specific situations. And yes, we know that uh, some of the measures that we took in places like schools and long-term care homes meant that we had no influenza transmission in those settings. So what are the pieces of those settings that we want to continue on? And um, you mentioned ventilation. That's certainly one of the important ones that helps reduce transmission of all kinds of things. So we are uh, working with our school team to look at what are the important things to keep for, for next school year and which are the ones that we no longer need to have in, in place so that uh, um, children and, and staff and, and um, educators can get back to a more normal environment in schools. Stop. 
And just a couple of other things with respect to long-term care. Um, as you know, the single site order has been in place and it was made real in BC, uh, more so I think and in other jurisdictions in Canada by the speed with which we did it and by wage leveling that happened and we intend, it's our intention to continue that and that's the direction. Um, uh, secondly, we're hiring, as you know, 7,000 uh, long-term care workers as part of a plan we introduced last September, uh, part of our fall and winter plan that was to continue on over three years already to date. 5,000 have been hired, which is uh, impressive under those plans, including under the HCAP program, but also to support visitation, which is, an, I think, um, an impressive achievement. I think uh, uh, there are, of course, lessons to learn. And I think, finally, the significant imp imp investment that's coming in long-term care capital to especially uh, address multi-bed rooms. Well, it is true that most multi-bed rooms are in Health Authority owned and operated care homes, which on balance had fewer outbreaks. Uh, multi-bed rooms have been identified by everybody in public health as something we want to move away from, not simply because uh, uh, of issues of infection, but because uh, these are people's homes and, uh, and having uh, single bedrooms is a better approach. So you're going to see all of these significant changes that have come uh, co coincident with the uh, pandemic, in some cases advanced by the pandemic, continue on. And in addition, of course, we've achieved our goal of meeting the provincial standard across health authorities with respect to uh, the staffing and care standards in care homes. And uh, uh, as you know, 85% of care homes didn't meet that standard uh, three years ago. And that, that's been changed and that made a big difference uh, throughout the pandemic. Next question, Shannon Patterson, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, while the province's vaccination rate is climbing, there are still some areas with lower coverage. Uh, one of them we noticed in Metro Vancouver is Richmond. Can you tell me what you think is happening in Richmond? And also generally, what is the message for those who have yet to get a first dose? And how is BC encouraging them to do that? Yeah, so we have been obviously looking at this in some detail in many different communities. So we're, uh, uh, Dr. Ballum calls it our ground game. And, and so we've uh, um, advanced that in many different fronts. So that is connecting with community leaders, collecting with uh, faith leaders, connecting with um, other parts uh, of uh, where people are in uh, different communities to bring vaccine to them. We know that most people are doing the right thing and getting on board and coming to the clinics, but for some people it's more of a challenge. So in, in the interior we've been uh, seeing a mobile clinics going around to smaller communities where it is more difficult for people to to access one of the uh, the standing clinics. We've also uh, seen uh, the um, easy clinics uh, popping up in, uh, in and around uh, Fraser Health and similar things in Richmond. There's been uh, work done with Vancouver Coastal working with uh, different community groups to, to uh, basically spread the word and make it easier for people. And I, I've talked to, about this before. We, we know that we reach a certain level and, um, a, and then we have to take different strategies to reach people. And there's a couple of different things that are of a concern. Sometimes it's complacency and that certainly is a, a factor in many of the uh, more rural communities where there's not a lot of transmission and, and it takes a great deal of effort to go out and actually find a vaccine. So making it easier for people, understanding that it's, it's not just protecting you but it is protecting us all, um, making it convenient. And the other one is having confidence in the vaccine. So those are all things that we're working on in different areas of the province and there's all kinds of innovative things uh, that are going on in different places. Yeah. In um, Richmond, I know you... Yeah, um, I, I just want to recognize um, the people of Richmond, um, our, uh, our MLAs who have been uh, incredible leaders on both sides of the house, um, the mayor, the community, Vancouver Coastal Health, Dr. Ballum. If you look at Richmond's numbers now and where we were a few weeks ago, um, Richmond is now, at, in terms of registration, above the provincial average in terms of registration. And the gap um, that existed on vaccination is closing and closing fast. So I think that is a real achievement for people in Richmond. I want to acknowledge everyone people in media who uh, who supported this in Richmond and getting information out the clinics that were provided it's really a remarkable achievement and we're going to do the same kind of things um, across the province for example the first dose immunization clinic in Cherryville at, uh, at Frank's grocery 
the fact that there are BCC CDC nurses, uh, a number of them since the beginning of June in Fort St. John, four more coming next week to increase the number of immunizations, and we're doing lots of work um, with uh, the, we're going to be doing lots of work with the mayor in Dawson Creek and in Fort St. John on those questions. So uh, we're going to go step by step and increase those immunization rates uh, everywhere. That's the plan, to work with communities and to support communities. And I think these are good examples. Uh, a number of weeks ago you saw UBC very low in terms of immunization as a community health service area because UBC has a lot of young people and this was an age-based process. Well, you've seen now that number comes significantly up, but in terms of registrations, it's above the provincial average. So I think that what we're seeing is that work getting done everywhere in the province, and we're just going to keep working with communities to raise those levels, which is important. Uh, it's as important in Surrey and Delta and Richmond as it is in Fort St. John and Dawson Creek and Cherryville, and we have to do, continue to do that work. Shannon, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, the news today is, is incredibly positive, the reproductive number being where it is. The, uh, even the, the, the worst case scenario projections are so much better than anything we've seen. Dr. Henry, what could undo this? Is there a scenario where this could all go sideways? And what would have to happen for it to go sideways? Would it have to be an explosion of a variant resistant um, or a, a vaccine resistant variant? Uh, you know, the, these are the questions that um, keep me awake and make me anxious every time I look at our case rates and our case numbers and the modeling when it comes up. Um, it, you know, it, it is very reassuring. We are in a different place. And it is because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not given to hyperbole, but because these vaccines are so good and they work well and they last, you know, those are the things that we had all of these questions about. And as time goes on, we're seeing what's happening in other countries. We're seeing things like uh, the fact that uh, the, the antibody response is, um, is stronger and lasts for, for three months, six months. And that interval that we have, uh, that we made that decision to, to get first doses into people as quickly as we possibly could, we're now seeing that uh, delaying the interval um, by as much as 12 weeks actually gives people a stronger, longer lasting effect. So that means that that will last us through, uh, hopefully, uh, next fall, next respiratory season. So these are all the things that we're learning as we go. And uh, it, it is, I'm, I, I am optimistic in a way that I've not been for a long time. And it really has to do with how well the vaccines are working and working over time. And yes, we are concerned about the variants, and that's why I spent quite a bit of time um, talking about whole genome sequencing and how we are watching every single uh, strain in every single case. And remembering, of course, that it's not just a, a variant that's out there, it's a person, and it's a person who's infected with a strain of the virus. And we need to watch those. Every time the virus replicates, it changes a little bit. So we could potentially have a strain arise here that has a mutation that means that uh, the, the vaccine doesn't work as well against it. But that probability goes down and down and down quite dramatically when we reduce the number of people who are infected. And then if we have an introduction, we can stop transmission from that introduction. So yes, um, we are in a good place now. We need to get our cases down as low as we possibly can before we head into the fall because we know that there's going to be more virus circulating, whether it's COVID, whether it's influenza, RSV, parainfluenza, all the other things, enteroviruses and adenoviruses that we see in the fall. So we have to be prepared for that. And we know that globally, uh, we need to start supporting in a bigger way um, protection of people in other countries because every time you see an explosion of, of transmission and more people being infected, there are going to be variants that arise. Uh, and we saw that in India, for example, in Brazil, in the UK. Um, so it's a, kind of a long way of saying um, we need to keep our eye on the global picture uh, we are in a good place now to slowly start moving ahead, as we can see from, from the modeling that we've been looking at. But uh, there are always 
curveballs that can come, <laughs> or as I think Lisa uses said last week, you know, bricks to the head. So we are preparing for those. And part of the things that we're doing to prepare is making sure we have uh, public health resources to do adequate contact tracing, that we have uh, the public health lab resources to do whole genome sequencing on every single case so we know exactly which strains of the virus are infecting people in BC as we go ahead. So those are the things that we'll be watching carefully. Next question. Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. I'm just going to follow up with um, what, what Shannon was, was asking about because you, you did mention that we are expecting transmission to head into the fall, but how close are we to vaccinating children under age 12 considering that if that fourth wave happens, um, they won't be protected, and, and how can we be so fast to ease restrictions when kids are still at risk? Yeah, so there's a couple of really good things that are that but earlier today. Uh, so uh, um, the we know that Moderna has now submitted data for children uh, down to age 12. Um, and we're hopeful that that will be approved by Health Canada very soon in the coming weeks. Just makes things a little more flexible for, for us right now. But both Pfizer and Moderna are doing studies, what they call bridging studies, uh, down to uh, children as young as six months of age. Uh, one of the studies uh, from Pfizer was reported out uh, last week. It was looking at the amount of antigen that's needed in, in different age groups. And so there, they found that it is just as effective to have a half a dose, so it's 30 micrograms uh, in the, the adult dose. Um, they're looking at doing um, 15, or just sorry, 10 micrograms in uh, age down to age six, and then uh, I think it's five micrograms. I have to check my, my notes. But anyway, smaller amounts in uh, younger age groups. They've started the studies in those younger age groups. Um, their expectation is that we'll have information on immunogenicity and on uh, safety uh, probably by end of September, October, um, but before the end of this calendar year. So there is potential both for Pfizer and Moderna to have that information, to have vaccines available for younger people that, um, probably before the end of this calendar year. Having said that, there's also some really good data that shows that for every 20% increase in immunization in adults, 18 and above, even if you don't immunize children, they are protected. And Israel, um, some of this came out of Israel that if you reduce transmission in the community, you're protecting everybody, even those who can't be immunized right now, that's children. Um, so that's important to know as well. And it reflects the, the, the approach that we've had where it protects everybody. The more people who are, more adults who are immunized with the first dose, and the more we decrease transmission in our community. And that protects people who can't mount as good an immune response, whether that's because you're undergoing cancer therapy or you have an immune compromising condition. And we know that some people don't get as good a response even from two doses of vaccine. So all of us in the community um, being protected through immunization and reducing our case rates means that we're all protected that much more and there's data that supports that um, from a number of other countries already. So th those are the important things for us. Um, if we think about Canada and we think about BC, the proportion of our population that are children under the age of 12 is about 11 percent. So we can achieve very high protection levels um, and low rates of transmission in the community that is controllable even without immunizing children. So uh, that's kind of where we're looking right now. We, uh, I think globally it's um, imperative for us to protect healthcare workers and adults in many other countries. That's going to protect us all as a global community and then look to uh, how do we uh, protect children individually as vaccine becomes available later in the year. Marcella, do you have a follow-up? I do. I was hoping to ask more about um, the incentives that are being done to try to get as many people immunized as possible over the summer. I understand Fraser Health is going to be operating some clinics 24-7. So as we see more Moderna vaccine and more Pfizer vaccine being made available, are you, are you planning to make that standard across the province that we could see in one weekend having a clinic open 24-7? 
We could, you know what, this is things that we're doing on a local level, so uh, each health authority is looking at where their communities are, the strategies are slightly different depending on where your population is and and it may not make sense in a, uh, you know, in Penticton to do a 24-hour uh, clinic. It may make more sense to do a, a clinic at the farmer's market on Saturday mornings, uh, something uh, where a lot more people go. So uh, there is different strategies in different communities. That's one that works particularly in urban areas where people may not be able to get off work. And uh, I know there's all kinds of things that people are looking at. Some of the ones in the interior in the north where we have mobile uh, units that are now driving to different communities and setting up uh, uh, setting up shop and I understand there was uh, you know cake and, and cookies and, and uh, things available for people at a number of these that were quite popular as well. well just to, under, to understand that the limitation in delivery of vaccine is not um, our clinic time. We're delivering vaccine every week that comes to us. At the end of last week, uh, uh, Marcello on Sunday night, we were virtually out of Pfizer. We kept some for the Monday uh, day clinics, but that was it. So we are using the vaccine we have. So the the idea that we could expand capacity that will that will happen concurrent with getting getting more vaccine and finding different ways to deliver it in communities such as Fort St. John, when a lot of workers go off some distance to work and they may come back later. We're looking at models to at uh, hours of opening that will assist uh, communities like that. In a community such as Mission, where people also commute farther, often frequently to work, uh, especially in the cases that do into Vancouver, there may be a need to do more in the evenings. So we're looking at those kind of variations, but uh, we are delivering all the vaccine that's coming. I just want to say our teams, and led by Dr. Penny Ballum, it's just been exceptional. The idea that you can deliver vaccine to the most vulnerable to those clinically vulnerable, to our elders, to indigenous communities, to small communities in whole of community approach, and to deliver every week the vaccine into people's arms that arrives in large quantities on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays is a really extraordinary achievement done by British Columbians who deserve, uh, I think, our gratitude. We have time for one more question. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix have released a statement this afternoon with the latest information on vaccinations, cases, and hospitalizations, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. Final question to Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Yeah, Dr. Henry, uh, some people who got an mRNA vaccine want to get the same mRNA vaccine for their second dose. Uh, can anything be done to make sure people who are able to book appointments specifically for the vaccine they first received. Um, so could the system be updated to include information about whether Pfizer or Moderna is being offered at the clinic at the time of booking or should people uh, just consider the two mRNA vaccines as interchangeable? Yeah, yeah, the bottom line is um, we have good, strong support that these vaccines are interchangeable. Um, and it's not possible for us to, to on a day-by-day -day basis, it, it, it's, as we said, it's a just-in-time system with high volumes of vaccine arriving uh, to clinics on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it changes very frequently depending on which shipments come in. And the challenge has been Moderna quite frankly in the last little while so it's it, it is um, trickier for people who received Moderna first uh, to get uh, to be sure that they're getting Moderna but it should be easier um, it, we're hopeful that uh, uh, later on in June where more Moderna is available and our goal is to have both products available at all of the clinics um, and so that is uh, what we're trying to achieve um, it's not always possible right now just because because of uh, there have been the volume of vaccine, the volume of appointments, and trying to get things uh, continuing. And our system is, is not able to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, unfortunately. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. And if we could get an answer in French from my colleagues from Minister Dix, thanks. Um, you mentioned we'll be transitioning from pandemic mode to living with COVID uh, mode in the fall. Can you elaborate on what that looks like, um, for example, in terms of daily case numbers in BC? Like, are we talking 100 cases a day, 50, 10? Uh, and how will management of the pandemic change, practically speaking, uh, on a provincial level? 
Yeah, so uh, uh, from a, a, a numbers and data perspective, um, it will be more, uh, um, we expect it will be more like how we manage influenza and RSV, which means we look at you know things like how many cases are we seeing in a week, that we have sentinel s surveillance set up so that we can detect it when it's in a community recognizing that as rates are going down, we're going to have small numbers um, and hopefully no <laughs> um, uh, COVID in many communities over longer periods of time. So we want to be able to detect when it comes so that we can tell people that yes, there's some COVID circulating as we do with influenza every year. And then people need to take certain measures to protect themselves um, and uh, to get tested and things like that. So we are working on that. It, it, how we see it is um, that this virus is going to be another one of those respiratory viruses that at least for the next few years we're going to have to pay attention to. And that means in some communal settings, particularly long-term care homes, we'll need to have uh, our outbreak management um, and our outbreak uh, plans updated and uh, people need to be able to rapidly test and this is a place where you know we have rapid testing for influenza in long-term care we would have the same thing for for COVID and we would have an outbreak response if it was detected so these are all the things that are, are you know this virus is going to be with us we know that but it's not going to be able to spread widely when when you're in a pandemic it's because everybody in in the society is susceptible to it and we've seen how devastating that can be but what we are what we see and we can see it already in the in the hospitalizations and deaths is that as we protect people with immunization those go down and that means we can manage this in the community like we manage other respiratory infections like we manage pertussis like we manage measles outbreaks occasionally uh, like we manage other things um, and with public health working with you being able to to uh, stay home if you're sick um, keeping it from from spreading to those that we're closest to so those will all be the guidance that we'll be developing with people as we go through these next few phases and that we'll be looking at how to provide the, the advice that people need um, to keep safe over the fall as well. Merci beaucoup, just to say in French, I think we gérer euh, parce que le COVID-19 va rester avec nous euh, pour, euh, je pense, des, des ans à venir. Mais on, on va le traiter comme on traite euh, la grippe euh, d'une manière euh, chaque année maintenant, comme on traite euh, la rougeole euh, dans la province. On a eu euh, euh, des éclosions il y a un an et surtout en 2011, je pense, ou 2010. Uh, de la religion. Donc, on va avoir un effort de la, de la santé publique à fond pour uh, tester des gens, pour protéger des gens, pour limiter les dégâts quand, quand il y a une éclosion et surtout dans notre centre de, de, de soins uh, au long terme, de leur uh, protéger d'une manière importante. On va, je pense, que apprendre les leçons de la pandémie et on va continuer à agir, mais ça va euh, être de, de la même manière qu'on agit contre euh, plusieurs d'autres maladies. Et je pense que nous sommes en mesure de le faire. Bien entendu, il y a beaucoup euh, qu'on ne sait pas. Et c'est toujours le cas. Donc, il faut apprendre tous les jours. Et je pense que c'est la qualité de la, de la santé publique que j'admire euh, le plus. De, de ne pas de ne jamais prendre des décisions définitives mais d'apprendre chaque 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 jour et je pense qu'il va falloir faire cela mais je pense que nous sommes en mesure de répondre d'une manière manière mesurée euh, et sérieuse et je pense que des gens euh, qui ont qui ont euh, quand même euh, souffert des des revers importants depuis euh, euh, 17 mois maintenant uh, qui vont, qui vont uh, être avec nous dans cet effort. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we'll see you on Monday.